well, this is a special one today, guys. <laughs> it's so special. This is a special one. Um, we are just recording this after we have just done a podcast, which you're about to listen to, with one of the most famous golfers on the planet. Yes. This is really, really exciting. We've been trying to get this podcast arranged for a while now. Now, you know, if you're a fan of the podcast, the Richard's Golf Show podcast, you'll know we mention this particular golfer quite a lot. He's our bread and butter. He yeah. gets us the views. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to invite him on. Today, we have Bryson DeChambeau on the podcast. The ninth best player in the world, the longest player on the PGA Tour, eight time winner out on tour and also a youtuber I, I honestly can't believe we're sitting in now it's done it's dusted it's in the can and what an interview it was like an interview slash like getting to know Bryson a bit deeper he was incredible now this was done over zoom he's in Tory Pines at the moment so where we love to have guests obviously on the podcast and we love to have get the the audio absolutely perfect. This is on Zoom audio, so bear with us on that. Me and Mike, uh, me and Guy are on mics, but Guy is on Zoom. But you know, to be honest, Bryson. <laughs> well, that man, your name's Gyson DeCharnick from now on. <laughs> but Bryson's audio is still very good. Yes. We talk about a lot of topics. We obviously cover the topic about distance. Of course. We obviously talk about the topic of him being now friends with Tiger Woods. Of course. We talk about the fact, where is distance going to lead to? Mm -hmm. His strategy around St. Andrews this year. That was good. Which I thought was incredibly but interesting and insightful. One thing you had to ask him, you know, you've been known for calling out Bryson for not shouting for, so obviously when it came to the crunch, you didn't ask him that, did you? I might have asked him. He did ask him. Why he doesn't shout for? Right at the end of the podcast so he couldn't leave. Just when I thought we'd become mates. Yes. And I I th we're still mates, me and Bryson. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. We're mates. So, mm, Bryson sure messages you. Guy yes. didn't message me. That's actually a fact. But either way, guys, we could not do this without you. Mm. And we don't do soppy thank you so much and all this very often. But genuinely, thank you for being massive fans of the podcast. Thank you for listening, downloading, rating on Spotify, mm. watching the YouTube videos, watching the clips, supporting the Facebook page. You know, Guy works incredibly hard on this. I kind of just turn up and hold a mic and talk for a little bit. But but collectively, we're very proud of the product we've got to. Um, number one podcast in golf. And honestly, your support allows mm. things like this to happen. When we reach out to Bryson and talk about coming on the podcast, he's like, you know what? Yeah, yeah. I'll give this a chance. So a bar now, maybe Tiger Woods, we've, we're talking to the second biggest name in golf right now. So sit back, relax. And this is a deep dive into the world of Bryson DeChambeau. It is a good one. Enjoy, and thanks so much for listening. Thank you. Well, Bryson, thank you for being on the Rick Shields Golf Show podcast. This is very, very exciting. Um, I feel like the podcast probably wouldn't exist if it wasn't for <laughs> you, Bryson. I don't know about that. Stop. <laughs> There's plenty of other people that have been amazing. Your uh, your name gets mentioned many, many mm. times, so we're excited to have you on. Um, really is a, a, a privilege and a pleasure. Um, we want to kick off with nine quick fire questions and they're oh a little boy. bit a little bit tailored to you as well yeah, the, the kind of okay either or questions bryson but if you want to elaborate feel free so there's actually eight yep. right we did miss out one but anyway that'll do so first one nine holes or the driving range oh driving range that was quick is that easy yeah and is that has that always been the case or is it driving range now because of obviously quest for distance etc it's always been the driving range. So when I was younger, I would practice probably for about seven, eight hours a day. And then I'd go play three holes to make sure everything that I practiced that day worked well. And that was kind of my process that I went through every, uh, I would say every Saturday, because that's the only time I had to do that. But then every afternoon, I was always on the driving range. And I'd, I'd always go play like three or four holes. It was never like a nine hole thing. It was always, does my practice work on the golf course? Nice. And that's not changed. You're still driving range. Because I see you go on the range yeah. beforehand and even after rounds when you're out on tour. Oh, yeah. Yep, <laughs> for sure. All the time. I love it. It's uh, it's my happy place. I was totally the opposite as a junior. And that might be where I went wrong. I would much rather be hitting balls on the course than I'm on the, the range. Hey, I'm the same. I'll tell you this. There's plenty of people that don't use that model and have been very successful. So it's very tailored to whoever 
um, feels comfortable with it. And, you know, if it works for them, I mean, that's the most important part about golf. Everybody's so unique and different that there's not one way to play the game. I think that's the beauty of the game of golf. Thing is, though, it must be easy to hit balls in the range when you are flushing it. Like for us hitting balls, or certainly for me hitting balls, if I was catching it fresh every time at the middle of this, the club, I'd be really enjoying it. But when you're not and you're fattening them, you're thinning them, it isn't that fun. It, it isn't, and that's why you bring the torture of the golf course, I guess, for you guys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Do that. And that's the tough part because everybody's always like, what do you do when you hit five, six, seven shots in a row that are the exact same? I'm like, I want to hit 10 in a row. I want to hit 15 in a row. Yeah. Because golf is a game of repeatability. It's about how good are your misses, right? Oh. And so everybody can hit that one good shot that goes in the hole. I mean, I've only had one hole in one my whole entire life, right? Wow. Uh, yeah. What? By the way. <laughs> Yeah, and that was uh, I'll, I'll I'll get into that in a little bit, but yeah, I've only had one on one. That. I've only had like one perfect shot, right? Um, as people would say, but my bad shots are usually a lot better than other people's. Sometimes now with the distance and play and and uh, you know stuff that's going on there, uh, sometimes my bad shots can be pretty far off the line, but. It's fun. I, I enjoy it. You know, what I'm enjoying as much about. As I hate it, I enjoy it. <laughs> you know, what I'm enjoying about this so far. Go on. This is quick fire yeah on question one we've dived into so many sub questions um let's move in let's move into next question number okay, two number two netflix yeah. or youtube uh youtube yes that's the right answer yeah. that is the correct yep. answer tiger or <laughs> <Always>. jack <laughs> say again tiger or jack boy that's that's a tough one uh for me though it's it's got to be tiger just knowing him pretty personally it's yeah. it's it's great which must be pretty cool, by the way. Yeah, he's he's a great guy. I mean, to be honest with you, everybody you know could talk about what's gone on, but he's done things in his life for certain reasons, and um, everything he's done, I, I I for the most part understand um, from a protection perspective, just because you know he was never able really to live a normal life, mm -hmm. and um, I do have a lot of respect for for you know what he's done for the game of golf and how he's gone about doing it for the game of golf it's it's pretty inspiring and something i always look up to and the fact you can call him a friend now is pretty cool it, it's great it's very nice and um I, I respect it and you know it's not like we're, we're best friends or anything but it's it's something that you know i can call him up if i've got a question or something and you know, he's always there for me so nice. it's been awesome driving or putting it's funny um those are my two favorite categories in the game of golf. Uh, used to be iron play back in the day. I still love it, but uh, I would say right now driving just because I'm on the quest to understand, you know, what goes on at 200 mile an hour ball speed. We're getting closer for sure. Wow. But you, but is that yeah. is that like a 200 ball speed average? Because you, you, I've seen you cranking it over that 200 mark quite yeah. a few times. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Your body goes through swells uh, and, and ups and downs with how – ready you are to swing the club fast um so like yesterday i was swinging around like 190 93 mile an hour ball speed um pretty consistently uh but then two days ago i got to 216 ball speed with a long driver and so it's just like it's your, your body is just always fighting to try and get comfortable with whatever it's ready for that day uh it's not always muscular it's a lot of neurological stuff but um like your nervous system being ready to go your cns uh, and sometimes you're just not ready to go that day. Your body's not recovered. And it may not be muscular at all. It's just complete, like how your brain's firing that day. It's just not on point. It's almost like a, a runner. Sometimes a runner, as daft as that seems like quite a less complicated move than a golf swing. Yeah. Runners yeah. can have good days and bad days and good runs and 100%. bad runs. And it's not about their muscles. It's about their ability to just fire and, and have everything work in sync. Um, well, it's weird because we, I think I saw one of your YouTube videos about it's hard to feel fast. And we went to the range today, actually, and hit a few balls. We were inspired by your ball speed. Rick got 164, I got 160. Okay. So I don't want to flex too hard. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, wasn't, I wasn't fast today. I was just 164, you know. What, what, what was? But that, that's like my best of the best. I, what, need to, I need to up that speed. We were, we were trying okay. to get there. But what was crazy, we actually had Rick's GC quad as well. And I was trying to hit them hard. I was going like 108 club head speed, which I know is laughable. Yeah. But then I said, right, I'm going to do my on course swing and actually aim at a target swung what felt yeah. slower 113 yeah that, yep. it's weird exactly it, it's the weirdest thing so it's not about how hard you swing it it's about 
I guess you could say, when you swing it hard. Because like, if you try and swing it hard in your backstroke, you're going to lose a lot of energy. It's about when you deliver that energy. And so there's a lot of times where I'm feeling like I'm delivering it the same way, and I'm just not. Um, and it's something that no human can really understand it, it, because it's so complicated. Yeah. Uh, you can feel it and you can train it. The, those are the only two things you can kind of do for the most part. But sometimes the feel component of it or the sensation component of it is very difficult to line the mechanics up. Mm. Um, just it, it's super random. And, you know, you can kind of sense. So, so, for example, my body usually starts to work really well Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And that's kind of how I've primed it. And then I work out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, do a speed training session in between. Uh, and then, you know, I'm tired going into Wednesday and Thursday, I get better Friday. I feel really good. Saturday. I'm like, let's go. And Sunday, the same thing. So I'm kind of amping it up every week, um, to make sure that I'm producing speed at the right moment in time. Yeah. That's how you win golf tournaments. So yep. go back to the point you've got tomorrow. You can only do one thing. Are you doing driving all day or putting all day? I can only do one thing tomorrow. Uh, it'd probably be driving because we're still trying to figure out the the whole aspect of the driver. And it's a bit, uh, it's, and it's it's a bit more cool. fun. It's a bit more fun <laughs> driving, isn't it? It, it is. It's, that's the funny part about it. You know, people talk about growing the game of golf, and, you know, we can talk about putting, and that's a very important factor, but people just want to go out to the driving range, especially newbies, and hit it far. Mm. They see a lot of guys out there hitting it far, and they want to be like, I want to do that. I wanna, there's something super caveman-ish, I guess you could say, Big hitting – uh, something with a bat, you know, and, 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 a, and a club, right? <laughs> well, so the, even at the range today, just quickly, we, there's a couple of leaderboards that use Top Tracer, and the Top Tracer for longest driver had many more uh, participants than the than the leaderboard for closest to the pin. Correct. Because longest driver is the sexy part of it. It is. Correct. It's the fun and sexy part, for sure. So this one, it's an either or, but there's two kind of questions. So firstly, which is most important for golf? And then secondly, which do you enjoy doing the most? And it's squat or bench press? Oh, uh, squat for sure by a mile. Um, it helps create vertical ground reaction forces. That's a big deal for, for the golf swing. Your bench press, you're not really doing that since your arms are already pretty mm -hmm. far out. Yeah. And so it's not really doing much when you're gaining bench press. If anything, you're losing some mobility and trunk rotation sometimes uh, when you're doing that just because you're locking it in here and you're not used to rotating with your chest out. So anyway, that, long story short, squatting is um, a way better motion to do and train to get up in, in strength if you're trying to produce speed. But bench makes you look better on the beach, right? Oh, for sure. You can set <laughs> chest out, you know. <laughs> what kind of, like, rep range you train at then? Because, like, we were on this before, like, obviously kind of the bodybuilding split, you're doing, like, 10 reps maybe. But are you, like, at a one rep max or three reps? What's the kind of key? For, for people listening to this who want to get stronger for golf, what would you recommend to kind of aim for? The first thing I would say is listen to your body. I've got a, a trainer back in Denver, Greg Roscoff, who we talk in depth quite a bit about this. I also talked to Chris Como about this. You know, when is the right time? How much? What should I be doing? Right. And I go about it as kind of how I feel for the most part. There's some days where I'm like, man, I feel like I could move a lot of weight. And then I go try and move a lot of weight and I can't. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's, it's so weird because the brain and the conscious mind says, hey, I can do this, but I can't. Uh, when I physically try and do it. And so I'll adjust during the workout. It's always adjusting during the workout. If I feel like I'm good, um, I can try doing a one rep max. If I'm like, there's no way I can get this off my chest or whatever, I go down to more volume work and I'll go to a lower weight and I'll go more more reps. So it's not um, set It's not set in stone. It can vary on how you're no, feeling. You can, you can hurt yourself being set in stone, mm. trying to do something that your body's not ready for. Yeah, That's the one most important thing is, is injuries occur when <laughs> egos come about. And you've got to be careful with that in your body. And you have to make sure that you're pivoting when something's not not really working the way you want it to. Good advice. Only a couple more questions now. What first app you open in the morning? Probably Snapchat. Snapchat. <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 It, it's just, well. Is that because of yeah. you're on the hunt, or is that is that why? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, it, it's it's because that's how I communicate with someone. So ah, yeah, okay. yeah, getting that, getting it, that streak yeah, it's up. Good. It's good. <laughs> Rick, yeah, not that like he knows what Snapchat. Yeah, is. I've got no idea. Yeah, <laughs> and then I'll go to like um, Instagram, YouTube. I'll check out my YouTube page, and and that's what kind of how it goes. Are you nice. into analytics yet? Have you YouTube? Do you look at all that stuff? Your views and subscribers. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's addictive, isn't it? Yep. 
Yeah, it's awesome. It is addictive and it's a lot of fun uh, trying to tailor the content to the people and what they want. Uh, it's, it's definitely a lot of fun. And that's, that's one of the things for me, and I'm going to get into a little bit of detail here. That's, that's one of the reasons why I've, I've kind of slowed down in conversations with, you know, people uh, on the tour is it's, it's because I want to be able to give my side of the story mm-hmm. as genuine as possible. Whereas getting someone to manipulate some, some of my words and produce their content can create clicks and likes for them, which is great, but it puts me in a light that I'm like, Whoa, that's not me, man. I mean, I want to show you guys who I truly am. So YouTube has been a great avenue for me to, to connect to my fans and uh, tell the right story. So it's been awesome. Well, if, uh, if you can give us some tips for distance, Bryson, yeah. we'll, we'll give you a few little tips for YouTube in exchange. Perfect. I, I appreciate that. I need some help. <laughs> if you've got any questions for us, let us know. You can yeah, email, yeah, you can email us. No, but that's the thing though. Like <laughs> genuinely, you've done a really good job with it because I, I think one of the first videos I watched of yours was like, I think it's the most viewed, was the day in the life video where you literally went about mm-hmm. a day in the life. And like, obviously, it's great when you watch the PJ tour, the European tour, when, you know, the athletes give an interview post round, but you don't see much character. Like you, you can't, yeah. people say, oh yeah, I've got a bogey on nine, but birdie on 10 or whatever. Yeah. But when you can see someone's life and what they're actually up to, it does make you feel so much more like connected yeah. and actually like, like likable, not in a sense that people aren't likable, but yeah. it, it's hard to grow towards a golfer without knowing much about them. But that's what YouTube obviously yeah. gives you that platform to just be yourself and tell your story. A thousand percent. And I wish I could do more of those. I mean, people keep asking me to do them and I'm like, I wish I could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I kind of got a little tap on the wrist because oh, I did really? that. Mm. Yeah. Showing too much. Yeah. Well, just in case the listeners didn't know, um, Bryson, you obviously have a YouTube channel. It's been going, what, about a year or less um, than that? Just under a year. Just under a year. Yeah. And you're obviously doing, killing it on there 235,000 subs last time I checked. Yeah, not not bad. I mean, we're we're growing, and you know, for me, it's uh, again, this isn't where I make my money. That's that's not this. It's not what it's about one bit. It's just an opportunity for me to showcase um, my personality and character in a different light from what people have seen on Golf Channel, what people have seen on the PJ Tour. It's 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 tough to be. Uh, give me a second. It's tough to be um, fully transparent in the way you want to sometimes on tour. Yeah. So I must I must admit, I'm an avid watcher i feel like i've i've become to know you a lot more through your youtube channel your social media and i think yeah. that's really important for for not only yourself but you obviously your whole brand i mean it's, it's huge yeah. um so Absolutely. yeah people listening people watching make sure you go and check out bryson's youtube channel we'll link it below yes Thank you. um tough one for you here or it might not be a tough one win the masters or the open and by the open i mean the british open which one I would have to say the Masters for me just because I, growing up, um, watching Tiger and do what he did in 97, I mean, I was only like five at the time. I don't remember that. And then, um, you know, what he's just consecutively done. That's kind of really what inspired me. Now, I will say uh, when he won, was it in 2006, the Open? Was it 2006 uh, he won? Hoylake. Tiger won with yeah. Hoylake with his irons off the tee. That was really inspirational as well. Mm. Um, so it's difficult, but I mean, I've always grown up the masters has kind of been the thing for me just being an american it's yeah. kind of what they do i, I do uh, honestly all every european we've asked or certainly guys from the uk have all said the open and the majority of the u.s guys say the masters and, and it, it yeah. makes sense because yeah. it's what you've grown up with like we have right. certainly back in the day we used to have the open on normal tv so you didn't have to pay extra for it. You could watch it on normal TV. And it was almost something quite nostalgic about it, really. Mm. And I think yeah. when you've grown up, and certainly because, again, if you're from the UK, you've probably been to the Open, etc. I'm not sure about yeah. how, what that's like in the US, because I know it's obviously a much more selected, um, to be a patron, it's not as easy to get to as it would be for yeah. an Open. But it's what people have grown up with, really. Yeah. yeah. For, for me, it was the Holy Land for me. Like, like just growing up, envisioning myself being on property at the masters because we couldn't get there there was no chance to get there of course it's just a dip, it's a totally different vibe that i get and it's like wow i want to be there i want to do it i want to win you know that's just kind of the way it works for americans i guess i think i think green would suit as well pal i'm I not think, gonna say much more i think i think you've got i think i think you could carry that off yeah I there am. is a room there is a room there's a special place for something um but Good. Yeah, we'll see. Good. I am. We, we me and Rick are our, our, our podcast audience know we absolutely love St Andrews, and we've been fortunate this last six months to go a number of times. 
we said last time we were there, we cannot wait to see you around the old course. Yeah. Because I've got some questions on that. It is bit. obviously in parts wide open. There's a lot of room to miss. With your speed, your distance, I can't wait to see what you can yeah. do around there. Have you played it before the old course? I have not. So this will be my first time. And I'm super excited. Everybody tells me that, and I don't want to hype it up. But people said that about Caves Valley as well. I never played Caves Valley. And like, oh, this golf course is perfect for you. And mm. went out and played pretty well there. Um, so hopefully I have the same feelings going into to St. Andrews. And, you know, for, for me, it's always been an, uh, an honor to play amazing golf courses. And this is one I haven't played. You know, I've been to Australia. I've played Royal Melbourne and, and golf courses like that, but never St. Andrews, the home of golf. And um, to be able to play there, play a game maybe a little differently than, than what has been seen there before it could be fun. I'm not trying to disrespect the game of golf one bit. That's not my goal. My intent is to get the ball on the least amount of uh, shots into the hole. And that's always what it's been. As much as people think it's a bomb and gouge thing, it's like, no, I still love the, the heritage of the game of golf. That's why I uh, wore the cap and wear the cap as well uh, for Ben Hogan, Payne Stewart, and just the heritage of the game. I really appreciate that. And that's what I've tried to show uh, as much as possible uh, through these past couple of years, as much as I do like hitting it, hitting it far, I still try and show respect. And Hey, you got to putt well, you got to chip mm -hmm. well. And to win the U S open in 2020, I had to putt really well and had to wedge it really well in the, around the greens. And there's no doubt about it. I'm not ever going to for one bit, say it was my driving that won me that tournament. Um, you know, and so that's the thing that people don't, don't realize. Yes, it can be very beneficial, but when you're going to those speeds, you can miss it quite a bit offline and that could be very detrimental as well. If of you're not course. hitting it straight. So it is a huge balance there, but I love being an entertainer. I love showing a different side of, of myself and, and I love inspiring kids that if they really want to make a difference or a change in, in the world in their lives, they can if they work hard enough. And that was my whole message in changing my body, changing my game, delivering a different product to the game of golf and uh, hopefully growing the sport in that way. Well, that, that was one, this is actually one, we've got one more little question which we'll come to in a moment, but that was one thing I looked into because obviously everybody knows the story that you gained a hell of a lot of distance and I pulled up some stats, so I think these are correct off the PJ website, but in 2019, yep. you were tied 34th in driving distance at 302. Yep. So you weren't sure, I think sometimes people think that you were a short hitter before, but that to me isn't a short hitter, like you were th tied yep. 34. Um, then in 2020, you went to first in driving distance at 322. So you gained... 20 yards and that saw obviously yeah. your score average drop as well um you went down from 70.14 to 69.24 so pretty much a shot which is incredible but mm -hmm. there was and th this frustrated me at the time and i want to hear your opinion on this obviously but there was some kind of negativity around you gaining distance which i couldn't fathom if somebody spent a year or six months working on the putting and improved the putting stroke gained people would mm -hmm. applaud them for it but yet people seem to in the media sometimes hate on you for doing that and i personally don't understand it how did that make you feel did it did it get you down did it piss you off or did it motivate you even more yeah i mean there are times where it's definitely difficult to to um i guess take it um that's also why i started my own youtube channel i mean down the road it, you know it, it's been a little bit right to 2021 is when i started doing that but i tried to start producing some of my own content more um, and control a bit of the narrative because it was getting out of hand. It has, it has gone out of hand for no reason. And again, I get this world's about clicks and likes, um, you know, and that's where I've had, I've, do, do, you know, dove down into this world and it's been a little interesting for me to understand, you know, I don't want to do clickbaity material, but I also want to showcase, um, very intelligent, um, ideas and thoughts deliver it to the public as much as i possibly can while producing cool fun content right so it's this huge balance i'm trying to, to have and in, in doing this and that's a part of why you know i created uh, along with hogan and martin borgmeyer and hudson uh molten uh, registry we wanted to create a cool content group and whatnot but going back to you know all the criticism and, and whatnot in regards to getting length yeah there were times where it was like look i'm just trying to play the best call i can possibly play and if it's me hitting a farther, great. If it's me not hitting a farther because I pivot down the road because I find out it doesn't work for me, great. It doesn't matter. I don't really care what it is, what the final end result is. The final end result is me wanting to be number one in the world. Like that's my full goal is to do that. And however I get there, whether it's being the farthest on tour, being the shortest on tour, mm -hmm. I don't care. It's whatever it is that's going to work. And I'm, I'm still vetting out this process, seeing if it's possible because there may come a point in time where it's like, this length isn't doing as much as I thought it could. And, you know, the technology just isn't there and we can't do anything about it um, for years to come. I don't think that's the case. Uh, I really think that there is possibility moving forward um, 
with the drivers that were, were <laughs> developing uh, to you create a driver that goes straight at 200 mile an hour ball speed. But needless to say, it was difficult in 2020 and uh, one that you have to learn. You really have to grow as a person to be able to stomach a lot of uh, what people are saying to you. And, and that's just life now. There's a lot of uh, cancel culture thought out there and I understand it. And it's one of those things that for me, I've, we, we all as professionals in our own right have to be um, conscious of it and respectful of it and continue to move in a direction that you think is positive for yourself. Um, you know, for me, it's trying to grow the game of golf. Yeah, well, I mean, I've got some follow-up questions with that because I'd love to hear it from you again because I've, I've kind of heard it. I don't know. I don't think I've ever heard you particularly say it, but obviously with all criticism and things you were getting particularly last year, yeah. You mentioned you were looking at potentially quitting. Like, oh, yeah. what's the truth in that? Yeah. Explain. Yeah. I mean, this was like around FedEx St. Jude time where just people were just going, I mean, I couldn't say a thing right. There's nothing I could do. Right. And, you know, at a certain point in time, you just, you just look at it and you're like, I'm well off. I mean, golf for me isn't about money anymore. I, I really don't care about that. Um, I just have lost the love for playing the game of golf because there's so many people that are just going against me and they don't want to, they, they like seeing me down. They like knocking me down. And it's like, you know what? I don't need that. There's no reason to keep going on. I can go do VC work and be completely content yeah. and be really, really well for the world. Um, th there's no need to, to keep going down this road. And then I had a friend, Chris Pratt, I just gave him a call and he um, was, he's been a good, great friend of mine for a couple of years. And I met him at Riviera a couple of years ago before the pandemic. And he, he was awesome. Um, the first time I met him, we just kept in touch ever since. And just had a conversation with him and he was like, dude, like I get criticism and hate every single day for the movies I create, but the movies that I create and the characters that I am in those movies do not define me. Yeah. What defines me is the person I am around my family back at home. Yeah you know influencing the world in a positive way when i'm back at home taking care of my own life behind closed doors that's really what matters they're going to display you as this character out there whatever way they want to and you really can't do much to change it ever because it is what it is people have these own ideas and mindsets of who this person is and they're going to create it and this is the person that he is um and so he's, he told me he's like you got to play that fictional character in the best way possible because that is a fictional character that's not really you um, he says, yeah, you can produce your own content on YouTube and, and, and create, um, what you want and show them what you want as well. Uh, cause that is you on, on YouTube. Right. But people that are writing stuff, saying stuff and whatever, they're going to, they have a vision of, of who you are in your head. And that's not really going to change unless you keep playing that game, I guess, in the best way possible over the course of time. It's going to take a long time for that to change, but you got to play the fictional character and you got to decide if you want to play it. If you feel like you're a good enough character to play that in the way people think you are and kind of mold that into the way you want, then then do it. But if you don't you aren't ready for that, you don't want to do it, you aren't ready to take up that task, then go live a family life and call it a day. Yeah, it's yeah. not a big deal. Do, do you and think so like, in the last sorry, go on. No, no, and I just thought to myself, that's really great advice. And mm -hmm. you know, I took it on for that last part of the year where I was playing a a, a bit of a, not not that I was fake at all. I mean my high moments were really good. And I loved it. And I expressed great emotion, but the low moments there were there were times where it was really difficult, and I had to had to play a different person than what I was actually feeling. You know, people always talk about you got to show your good side when you're down, and sometimes when you're really down, it's tough to show a good side, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's everybody in general. And so, learning to mature through that process and saying, you know what, I can be a different person, like a, a good person when I'm really down was something that actually helped me and my character and my personality that, that will carry over into the rest of my life uh, forever. And, and it's a lot of thanks to Chris and him wow. helping me understand that. Um, so that was, that was kind of a, a really I guess. Tough moment. Yeah, no, it was a total character building thing and not very many people at 27 go through something like that. I mean, it, you know, you got top CEOs that are 45, 50, right. And they're just starting to go through things like that. Whereas you got to, 27 year old and you're like whoa but, but are, are top C ceos going through that like they're not in the public eye like like you are yeah you know true you are in the true. public eye i i honestly think right now 
we've said it a few times, like, bar the Tiger hype, you are the biggest hype in golf. Yeah. And as much as that's sometimes hard to take, you bring the most excitement, you bring the most topics, and you're right, you bring clicks, you bring likes to, to videos, media, whatever it may be, that does come with some nasty kind of words on the back back of that as well. What do you feel what do you feel's changed then in this kind of last twelve months then? Because I mean are you still experiencing the same emotions or or do you feel like you're over that now? Or has the, people's perception changed of you? Yeah, I hope people's perception has changed of me. I think I've grown as a person and I've been able to um I guess you could say sectionalize and and, and understand people a little bit better understand where they're coming from and go, you know what, even though I was saying stuff, it doesn't affect me one bit. Um, obviously with the stuff last year, uh, all leading up to the match and everything, uh, that whole stuff was trying to, to be like, look, this is just its own thing and we're going to keep moving on and, and, and going on in the best way possible. So it, it's a lot of character building, a lot of learning for me. And um, it takes time to develop that man. No human being, can take that much scrutiny and everybody look tiger had more scrutiny than me 1000 percent had it way more difficult and the way he handled it was his own way um i've tried to tackle it in a, in a, in a way that is more hey i'm going to be more open now yeah this is me this is actually me you know people think that you know because maybe i don't do media interviews i'm more closed off you guys can go right to my youtube channel and see exactly mm -hmm. who i am of course me talking to you guys you can you can see exactly who i am and that's the one thing that's so so difficult sometimes is to get people to say just take a minute take yeah. a, just take a few minutes and, and just watch because maybe things will change or be a little bit different um am i a perfect person no nobody is nobody right is. and i i struggle with the daily frustrations of man this isn't working what the heck's going on yeah you know what the you know a couple curse words here and there and that's just it just is what it is right we're all human beings and i think that's the the most important part is that if people can see that um, maybe they can have a little more resemblance toward that and they can understand what's going on, a little empathy and whatnot, and, and vice versa. Like th they can say all day long, man, you're making so much money playing golf, but it's not about money for me or a lot of the top players out here. No. It's about producing an amazing product of entertainment and trying to win just the competitive nature of winning. Right. And, and so that's the tough part for people to, to get. Sometimes it's like, you're making so much money da, 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 da. and it's like okay i understand that and i'm super grateful i'm super blessed i love every minute of that there's no issue whatsoever when we're talking about that but sometimes from an emotional state or human being state that's more important than money of course and so when people are doing that you got to realize like put the money aside talk about the human being for just a second and i think that's really important that people don't necessarily get sometimes if you could so child where do you feel like the most unfair scrutiny scrutiny is that the right word scrutiny. was scrutiny. What, what, what was based on what what was like the one thing that you were experiencing you were like no that's that's not fair that's not right um are you talking about me in regards to like last year or just in, just over else? the last 12 months for example yeah i mean is the one thing that now with an opportunity to go you know i, I get this said about me but it's not true oh I, I mean um uh i would say for the most part anything and everything that anybody said from a scrutiny perspective whether i'm hard to work with whether i'm um i don't even know what type of scrutiny people said that i am that i'm not uh other than being a demanding worker um, I, I, I personally know that I treat the people around me, uh, sometimes I'm, I'm pretty difficult. And the reason why I'm difficult is because I expect a lot. Mm. doesn't mean that I'm disrespectful all the time. doesn't mean that I'm, uh, hard to work for because the people that are around me are ones that want to be around me. Of course. And that's the thing that, that people don't realize. It's not necessarily a money thing. It's more of, I want to help this kid get to number one in the world. And, you know, you got a guy like, connor who's been next to me for the past year and a half and we've had tough moments but this dude is stuck right next to me and he's like dude i love you man like 
Yeah. It's not about money. It's not, about, it's, it's helping you to be the best you can possibly be. And as tough as people think I can be on the people that are around me sometimes, it's not necessarily true. I mean, I, I do so many things outside of, of just what you see there in public uh, behind the scenes and then what people realize they have no clue. And I'm not willing to disclose that either because no, of course you don't need to. a lot of it's, a lot of it's um, financial, a lot of it's putting him in places where he's able to, to be successful or other people are be able to be successful because of more opportunities. Now, I mean, there's, there's a lot behind the scenes that goes on that people don't necessarily see or understand. And it's tough when you see a face value thing and you get frustrated so much. It's just like you get frustrated with somebody that you're working with. Like, no, I want it to be this way. Can of we course. do it this way? This is how it should be. You know, it's <laughs> very, <yeah. laughs> but, I'm but no, no, but, but you hear, hear me out on that. Like, like everybody, whenever, no matter who it is, when you're working with somebody, sometimes there are frustrating moments mm, and there are times where it's amazing moments. Right. And so how you deal with that, I've learned to have better style points with it. If you can say Chris Como brought it up, it's, it's, he made a great point, point to me a couple of years ago. He was like, the way you go about things is very, very important too. And albeit we're not all perfect to get to an end result. It's really cool if you do it, but there's style points in the way you do it. Mm. And that's something that I've learned over the course of time and how I've been dealing with people. Uh, learning how to do that better is something that, that is, that is, um, uh, gotten a lot better one and two i've always cared about being mutually beneficial yeah i really want it to be mutually beneficial whenever i'm working with someone or somebody's working for me or vice versa and i think that's why you know you can see i've been with my agent for so long um he's unbelievable brett is the man connor's been with me and then tim i mean i, I love tim to death i worked with him for a long long time struggled to find a good caddy at first tim was unbelievable and now brian's working for me he's unbelievable as well um, you know, people can say all that they want in regards to the caddy situation. There was a lot more going on at that point in time than uh, I'm willing to disclose no, behind the scenes. And I've said, it, I've said it before. Um, I respect him. We have mutual respect for each other. Um, I talked to him numerous times. I mean, I texted him the other day when he was with uh, Svensson in Hawaii, he had a chance to win. I texted him like, hey, go get him, you know, right. like it, no issues at all. And that's that's the thing that I, I wish people could – see in the background but it's and i don't want to brag about it i'm not no, like no. trying to brag about it one bit it's just one of those one of those things i wish it, people understood more of a real life situation of, of who i it's am it's, this is very very different but like it's frustrating we when people think they know you or what you do and they don't and we again very different but we sit a little bit in the content that we make people might scrutinize how rick has reviewed a golf product or whatever it might be sure. and they don't know what has gone on behind the scenes and you know yeah. it shouldn't frustrate you but you People's opinions can get you down, can't they? You, you know what I was just, yeah, the, the 100%. You know what I was just almost yeah. comparing it to then is a relationship. Any, rela is. any relationship. Now, I've been with my wife now for 14 years, nearly 15 years. And there's obviously great times. There's obviously some worse times where you argue, whatever it may be. Now, you'd like to think in a, a private relationship, those bad times happen behind closed doors nobody gets to yeah. see them um yeah. and as the the good times nobody wants to see <laughs> nope. nobody wants to see that but it, <laughs> but it happens behind closed doors either way i think having any relationship in the public eye is very very difficult mm. um right yeah. i want to i want to pick up a bit of an upbeat tone now i feel like we went deep there bryce it was nice though. which i think yeah, people will appreciate at the moment as guy mentioned there your uh Distance now is 322.7 yards. You are the longest player on the PGA Tour. First question, did you ever expect that when you were kind of growing up? Did you ever expect to be the number one longest player? No, I always wanted to be like uh, Colin Morikawa. I wanted to have the best strokes gained approach to green. That was always my goal. Yeah, I mean, he's pretty awesome with his irons. It's unbelievable <laughs> it's impressive to see one that uh i'm, I'm even jealous of <laughs> and then my next question is where honestly right now let, let's give it a th let's give it a five year window where do you reckon and it whether it's you whether it's somebody else what distance do you think will be the number one longest driver in five years and, uh, and will it be you 340 345 so and it probably won't be me so another 20 yards why will it not yeah. be you? What, why, who, and who do you think it could be? Somebody that you know? or um, There's numerous guys that have my speed, uh, whether it's Cameron Champ, Wilco, Nina Barr, or whoever. They're going to learn to have 2,000 spin on a 195-mile-an-hour ball speed driver, and that's a 340 drive. 
Wow. So yeah. it doesn't even have to be Kyle. You make Kyle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Kyle, shoot. If he gets out of here too, I mean, yeah, he'll be the longest by a long shot. And if he's out here, it'll be probably 350, 360. Wow. That'll probably be his average. How is Kyle Burks just so fast? Obviously, for those listening, he's, he's the world long drive champion. Yeah. Like, he's obviously, what is he, like 6'2 or something? He's like not a small guy, but he's not no. like, he doesn't look super he's built. Not, he's not super built either. Um, I mean, again, being super strong like a bodybuilder doesn't mean you're going to necessarily swing it fast. It doesn't one bit. No. Um, so you have to train the speed to create speed to this small window right here. Yeah, you're building it up, and then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. whoa, you accelerate it really fast. Because you're trying to be fast up here, you lose all this energy up at the top. Uh, anyway, it's about timing, and he's learned to add the speed at the right moment in time with his frame. He is possibly the best at expressing the best acceleration profile for any human being in the game of golf. So what I mean by that is that he's able to accelerate the club the best in the world with his body frame. He's probably maxing his body out. He's, he's close to maxing his body out. Wow. Whereas a guy like me, I'm a little bit stronger than him in certain areas. He may be, I think he's fractionally stronger than me in deadlift. Um, but I still got a lot more room to go, but I have to hit it straight. Mm. So I put a lot of restraints on my golf swing. Um, so that's why I'm not always over 200. And if I want to get over 200, I can get over 200 any day of the week. Uh, but it's more of, okay, I got to play golf with equipment that if I hit it all over the face may not necessarily work yet. Um, we're testing actually today. Funny enough. Uh, yesterday was the first day where I saw some light at the end of the tunnel. I was like, oh, okay, this is different. I could hit it a lot of different places on the face and I'm at work and we're doing some more research today on the driving range. Um, We've got some cool stuff in the trailer that uh, not yet going to be unveiled, but it's helping me understand what needs to happen uh, for a ball to go straight, being able to be hit everywhere on the face. And are you, and are you having quite a big, a, quite a big say in this now, moving forward? Say again. Are you having quite a big say in this, working with, let's say, Cobra? Are, are you? Are they taking your input? Are you? Are you heavily involved in some of this production, this development? There's a reason. There's definitely a reason why I brought, or oh, I wanted to bring Kyle on board, and Cobra wanted to bring Kyle on board. And there's definitely a reason why I said certain things last year that I shouldn't have said. <laughs> um, if you can read between the lines there, and but that's a positive thing. Like we've moved past that. We're in a place where it's really solid, really, you know, great. And I don't want that to be like a bullet point. By the way, guys, I just want it to be like, look. There was a, we were at a moment where we were at crossroads and we figured that out. And now we're moving forward and we're in a place where next year. So we have the LTDX, obviously, came out this year, which is an unbelievable driver. And then we've done a long drive, drive face for it. So it's been very helpful for me. I'm going to be using it this week and moving forward. But I'm telling you, there's something special coming next year. There's something oh. like, yeah, we've been working on this for a while. And the Bryson. Um, <laughs> the Brysonator. <laughs> no, no. I, I, it's a really cool name, but I won't. I can't disclose anything or any, anything. That, but just know that this that. is this driver is a precursor to what's what's coming next. Does that ever, when an athlete like yourself has such an impact into a product, which obviously you are doing, do you ever kind of get a bit pissed that you can't be using that almost like next week when you know how good it's going to be, or is it almost yes. just excite you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <I'm, laughs> it's like uh, you know the guy. <laughs> Uh, the uh, ice cream handle. He's scooping the ice cream out on the on the street, yeah. and he puts it on, and he, and he gives the guy the cone, and he oh, pulls yeah. it back out, and he's like oh, yes. throwing it around. I've seen that. <laughs> That's exactly what I feel like happens. That's like, a new like, here's a new driver. Oh, you can't have it yet, though. Here's a oh, new driver. Yeah, yeah. You can't have it yet. Yeah, yeah I get that. Um, is, is another question again on, on equipment. Obviously, you. I don't think you were the first ever, and well, in fact, I know you weren't with one length irons. There were there was players before you, but you obviously made it very popular. Mm -hmm. Do you think you're always going to use one length? Yeah. So so anybody can. I personally think that it's a great way to play the game of golf. Doesn't mean it's for everybody. I personally think anyone can use it still, and you don't have to swing like me to be able to use one length. But you, everybody for the longest time thought, oh, you got to be on the single plane thing to swing the, you know, one length irons. Those are two completely different, um, you know, accomplishments, I guess you could mm. say, or, or, or uses. You can swing on a single plane with variable length clubs and you can swing 
uh, single plane with one lane clubs and you cannot swing on one plane with one lane clubs and and the alternative as well right everybody swings with yeah. variable length clubs with different planes so what i mean by that is it it's not mutually exclusive to have one length and single plane but do you, you can have one length and, and swing any way you want do you still categorize yourself as a single plane swinger because your swing has uh, changed a lot no no yeah it's definitely different now um because you know where near is, you don't have your hands you don't have your hands anywhere near as up right now at setup do you no it's for speed purposes um yeah that's that's been a development of my theory in the game of golf i had a theory when i was 15 swinging on one plane would make it a lot easier and it did help me for a long time and i got to a place where i started to understand the biomechanics a little bit more and my eyes opened up quite a bit in relation to that that the golf swing is driven by how movable your body is and where your wrists are aligned and where your elbows align, where your shoulders align, and how it's dynamically moving through impact and how to take some variables out um, that are not that important for speed, but help a lot with alignment and then add the speed components where I can uh, and the body motion. I don't know if that makes any sense whatsoever, no, no, but no, it does. it's gone more to a body approach compared to like a swing plane approach. I, I Obviously, when you first hit the scenes and you were you were kind of called the mad scientist of golf, right? Yep. It was all very new, you know. Because what what's your degree yep. in it? Something crazy in it. Your degree? Uh, so physics. Um, I thought it was. I thought is it got a long? Is it got a long description for it? Or is it just physics? No, it's just it's, it was just a physics major. Oh, yeah, right. maybe I I read something wrong. Um, when you kind of hit the scene, it felt like everything was unbelievably calculated and it still is for the most part well this is what i was going to ask you when you come to your driving to the untrained eye or maybe to the un- or, or to people who aren't in your inner circle it looks a little, a little bit more like barbaric in in the way yeah. that you're getting speed it, is that the case or are you still unbelievably kind of scientific in your approach to actually gaining more distance uh, from an accuracy perspective, I'm always very scientific in regards to how I'm moving my body. And then I'm allowing certain speed factors to just go as fast as they want. And sometimes that misaligns some of the body alignments, but I'm, it is very calculated. So when I'm thinking about it, I'm definitely thinking about what, but it's also about what feels good. So I have a theory in my head about like what, where the body should be aligned. And then if it doesn't feel good, I'm not going to keep doing that. It's going to just be degradative to the process. Process. So I go to something that is locked in or whatever I do to develop it, and I try and produce as much speed off of that locked in nature. Would you? Um, would you so ever? That's... Would you ever sacrifice that then locked in, if you could unlock more speed? Y- yes, but then I eventually go back to locking it down and then trying to get more speed mm. again. Ah. So it's this. It's this ebb and flow of it gets a little loose, and then I come back yeah. to like now I've got a little more in tune. And then, you know, the next couple of weeks is probably going to go more to speed. Um, so it's this flowing nature of calculation. So, it's it's a educated process of flow <laughs> and speed to accuracy. What's the difference then now? Say you're on a tight par four and you're hitting driver. What would your club head speed be then compared to when you're kind of going all at it on the on the range? Doing oh, the range? It's 15 miles an hour different. So what are you hitting on the course I mean, at one? 30, is it? 130 to 133 and then if i'm really going at it i can get it upwards of 140 and then if i've had enough golf balls i can get it to 145 one wow and that's with a 45 inch or no so you have to eventually change it to go to the longer yeah. club to get even more speed but i can get a 46 inch is what i'm playing right now i can get a 46 inch up to 140 one, 142 that... if i'm going out on the range which i probably will do today <laughs> is that gonna be is that the limit now isn't it 46 on tour or is it soon yep. to be introduced? They took that, it away. That's the limit right now. Yeah, on the PGA Tour. Yeah. You, I, I got a sense of a little eye roll there. Is <laughs> is is? No, I didn't mean anything by it. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's the right the right thing or wrong thing to do? Look, right or wrong, that's. I, I don't think you can ever say something's right or wrong because it's all up for conversation, right? Any sports rules that are made are all very arbitrary and they just are what they are um whether i think it's positive for the game of golf i think they aren't necessarily looking at golfers that are trying to get more distance and they can't just because 
you know, they aren't necessarily they're either handicapped. They've got something wrong with them or they're super tall, right? They're seven foot tall. Like you're handicapping the, the game of golf when you set rules and limitations, not really thinking of the full spectrum of things. Um, you know, I think they do have uh, an, an amendment or something or a salt, small subcategory that if you are seven foot and you do need longer clubs, you can go past 46 uh, or 46 and so 46.2, I think is the, and the that's on that's length. on tour. Yeah, on tour and tour. And, and so, you know, then they they uh, nix the green books as well or the, the players nix the green books, which, you know, is one of those things that, OK, I get it. But, you know, at a certain point in time, you start feeling like okay this is a little weird i mean yeah. face on my mechanical compass the green reading materials <laughs> um the length of driver i mean when they start doing what's going when on? they start doing flat caps yeah you know the band on a sunday <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. well, well, we, well we had phil kenyon on the podcast a few a few weeks ago and uh, obviously yeah. his take on the greens he books was happy. uh yeah, wasn't wasn't particularly happy, and and also he wasn't happy. No. And also the spirit level, is it something you can't use a spirit level now on the greens? So you can't use any level or anything to measure the the ground. You can you can use your feet and you can write it down in a book. Um, you know, it's a bit unfortunate they uh, took away a process of mine that I've been developing for thirteen years and some intellectual property with it. Um, so it's kind of tough on my end. Yeah, just a bit. But that is, yeah, that is it's it's a little. And, and it's like, look, I, I get it. They're trying to go back to more of a look at it with your eyes and feel it with your feet sort of mentality. But there's a huge skill set to somebody learning how to utilize the green books mm. to another level. Mm. And, you know, they're trying to make it more confidence level driven. Like we're trying to take away confidence. So, you know, it's a little more. But then you had the lowest scoring the past couple of weeks. Yeah. It's, it's like in Hawaii. What are, what are we doing? How much is the green boost really helping? In 2003 to this, to this year's stats, the strokes gained were actually worse. <laughs> and there's other reasons for that. But but it's like it's not helping. And so by taking out certain players' ability to play the game of golf in the way they learned how to play, I learned this, Rick, when I was 13, 14, 15. Yeah. And I've grown up with this mm. with the system. That's how I play golf, you know? That's how a lot of kids have learned how to play golf. That's a lot of, how a lot of kids have trained themselves to putt well. That's just the way they do it. And by taking it out, you're just the ability for kids to use their brain. It's not like, you, you know, you, you take the, the guy that's 6'10", yes, or, uh, last week that, that played, and, and say, hey, we're going to take two inches off of you because you're too tall. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of what you're doing mm -hmm. with – my brain and my brain's ability to figure a situation out of course you know, one of my greatest assets in my body is problem solving and, and my brain is body solve uh, is, is problem solving and i think that by taking that away it's a little i don't want to say that word but you know it can be sometimes it, it can push somebody in the wrong direction mm. really really quickly sometimes saying nothing in that moment is powerful enough <laughs> I think that was that yeah. was perfect well we've got a friend of ours who's the tallest golfer in the world he's seven foot seven and a half inches oh my gosh okay he's called paul sturgis he's called tall paul okay and that's amazing he uh believe it or not he is still limited to only a 48 inch driver wow and he honestly it looks it's like so a, small. it looks like a kid's club when he's yeah. when he's hitting it that's so that's so unfortunate because i feel and like I, I i just feel like that's just not inclusive yeah um and that's the tough part I, you you know you have somebody that can't control it like they can't control my brain I, I just developed it and this is the way i think and this is the way i do things and it's just they're, they're just not being inclusive with that it's, it's kind of frustrating um but i understand i i understand to some level you know that's a very very unnormal thing to have right of seven course. foot seven yeah. golfer, right and <laughs> yeah. i get it but you know you you want somebody like that to, to play the game and you know why not yeah. why not mm. let him play something that's comfortable for his height yeah right and instead of him hurting their back and whatnot and all that i mean yeah. there's no harm no foul especially on the amateur level of course if he's a professional no 
I mean, let's have a conversation about it and go like, okay, that's fair. You know, let's find something, let's find a compromise. Yeah. And that's the frustrating part is that there was really no compromise in this. No. It wasn't, it, it, you know, in regards to the Greens books or, or length. It was it was just, this is what we're doing, call it a day. Yeah. And it's like, guys, you have one of the, a few of the best players in the world that are going, what are you doing? Yeah. Can we talk to you about it? Can we, like, try and figure out a solution and a compromise? No. Ah, yeah, that's not. You need a bit of open. You need a bit of dialogue there, right? Um, for sure. You, you Especially t- when you're trying to make it work for everybody. You touched on before how um, you want to be number one golfer in the world. Yeah. As do I. <laughs> as do, as a, as did eleven year old Ricky Shields, but not anymore. <laughs> what 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 also is on that tick list? What are your career goals right now? Well, career go- go- uh, Grand Slam is a huge deal for me. Um, and then I want to get to 20 wins at least. Well, you're, cur- you're currently on eight, is it? Yeah, I'm in eight. So, got a ways to go. But it's not terrible, but it's not. I mean, there's a year. 2018 was when I was hitting the best of my life. Just dead straight. You know, I had my golf swing really dialed in. Putting was really good. And I gave myself a lot of chances to win. And I did win. Yeah. Uh, but. The next year, I kind of lost my golf swing a little bit, and I couldn't figure it out. And that's when later that year, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to try and hit it farther because yeah. I think hitting it farther will give me a better opportunity. And it did. I won a couple more times, um, you know, and I gave myself a lot of chances last year as well. Now, this year, I feel like I have that speed. We're getting to a place where the driver is working in a really good way. Uh, and then my putting has gotten back to its level in 2018. I figured something out at uh, – well, this off season, and so I put it pretty well at Kapalua. I feel like, um, even though I didn't have any greens books or whatnot, I was rolling it well. So it's going to take some time for me to adjust and, and learn how to use my eyes again a little bit more. Um, I was still using my eyes. It was it was not like, but I'll go, go, just to go back to that real quick. You went blindfolded. Everybody, everybody, everybody thinks I was using just all math to do putting. No, I mean there's spike marks. There's bumps mm. there's a bunch of different stuff on the green you got to look and you got to be like ah my intuition's telling me it's not this way and you got to go with your gut and the end at the end of the day so there's a lot of feel still in play you know and i at certain times lost a lot of confidence because of what the greens book said because the greens books aren't always right right that's, that's where it's like it's a huge skill set you got to learn to be able to utilize that that greens book and that's where it's frustrating when people don't use it they're like oh it should be gone well you've never tried it you've never used it you don't understand its frailties and faults yeah. and it's it is downfalls it's pitfalls and and that's kind of the, the the tough part for me anyway i don't know why i went back on that rant that's just a whole nother it's all right, it's all right. so so um, that's that's career goals what's yeah what's 2022 goals uh winning a major uh and winning a few times on tour definitely give myself give myself plenty of opportunities on the back nine of tournaments to win mm-hmm. a golf tournament to close it out what world ranking will Bryson DeChambeau be at the end of 2022? Will I be? Oh, man. I, I don't even know. I, I hope top five, and I very much so hope number one in the world, but that's going to take a couple wins and playing really well this year. You meant We touched on it slightly earlier. St. Andrews, obviously, this year, um, home of golf, the Open, 150th. Yeah. It's going to be, for, certainly over here in the UK, I don't know of a single open that's had more buzz ever. No, this this one feels yeah. different. I think hopefully really? the Tiger going to be there as well, and just the infrastructure around St Andrews, it's going to be amazing. And I, and I just think at the moment, when you look at the best players in the world, I mean, you'll know there's there's, I mean, any one of the top fifty, any one of the top hundred can go and have a, can go and have a week at the old, at the open. Yeah. Yep. And and when you look at the top 10, you look at the the field and how well everyone's been playing recently, you just think, "Oh my yeah. goodness." So I've got a question for you. What's your strategy? Ooh. Well, my strategy is going to depend on the weather first off. You know, it's a it's a golf course where maybe a lot of irons off the tee is the play. Um I, I don't know. Maybe it is hitting it really far and bombing it up next to the, the greens and having a great wedge game. Uh, there's, there's a couple of ways I could play the golf course with the length because sometimes people think about my drivers. Oh, it gives them such an advantage. What really gives me an advantage is my irons, mm-hmm. being able to hit an eight iron 210 yards, being able to hit a nine iron 195, um, you know, a six iron 240 yards. So, so this is, this is where 
you know, the conversation of the strategy, what is my strategy? It's one going to depend on the weather uh, and conditions of the course and, and what I'm comfortable with as well. Two is, is what I'm comfortable with, you know, given my game, my current game situation. So You mentioned before you've never played the golf course. Yeah. Do you feel like you know the golf course at all much? Yeah, I've played it on PGA Tour uh, 2004 <laughs> plenty. <laughs> <laughs> when you shoot like 50 under for the whole right. tournament. One of the big tips we had when yeah. we played is that miss left. If you're going to miss, miss left. Yeah, left There's so friend. much room. But with that, with regards to the weather then, as a long hitter of or the longest hitter, do you want it hard or soft? Because I'm guessing if, it, if the course is harder, the shorter guys get obviously so much more roll as well. So do you want it to be a little softer or do you want it to be baked out where you can just be hitting irons off the tee and out driving people who are hitting driver or whatever? Probably softer and then firm for the greens. Mm -hmm. Because you can That's fly it in nice of, and yeah. high with like a nine Correct. iron where others are hitting Six, five so irons yeah. or whatever it may Correct. be. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's quite, that's really exciting. Do you, will you get an opportunity before July to, to play it at all? Probably not. I'm probably going to play the Scottish before the week before. Um, get somewhat com comfortable with league style golf and then uh, head over there. I'll try and play as much as I can, but, you know, not much I can really do but with all the restrictions it's kind of tough to go over there and uh you get over there early and play and um and the timing my schedule all of that pretty difficult so one thing we need to do bryce if we can certainly when you're next in europe is we did a video recently where rick played with tommy fleetwood and it was mm. a course called jcb which is amazing uh, obviously stroke play tommy fleetwood would destroy rick destroy me so rick had a handicap of 10 so rick started 10 under par tommy started level par obviously and the yeah. match went right down to the wire and on hole 18 they actually finished level and and this is on a golf course again over here in the uk we don't get many golf courses upwards of seven and a half thousand yards it's this, a beast this yeah. plays about seven thousand seven hundred so i think on a on a on a normal golf course around the uk 10 probably be too many shots, not easily win. Yeah. But on a proper championship golf course. So I, so I would love to get some guarantee next time you're over in the UK or, or our schedules collide, me versus you, I start 10 under yes. and you start level par. For sure. That'd be fun. Do you think you'll beat me still? Yes. Uh, would. I, would, I would hope so. I would hope so. Because even if, because <laughs> on that particular day, it was very, very cold, very wet, very windy. It was it was a tough, it was yeah. in December here in the UK, so it wasn't particularly nice weather. But I was yeah. even thinking if it's in the summer, you're going to go around in probably six under, five under, around a, a, a kind of golf course, normal golf course. For me, around the golf course that's that long, I'm not getting that close to par. You know, you're happy with five over. I'd be shooting really? four or five over. So that's why I think it's yeah. such an interesting match. Um, like mm -hmm. I say, on a, on a slightly shorter course, even at someone like St. Andrews, I think it'd be much tighter. And I think 10 would be too many. But on a proper long golf course, I think that's, that's one we've got to plan. For sure. For sure. Definitely. One thing you touched on then that interests me as well, we, we mentioned this kind of myself and Rick when we planned the podcast, was that you've gained so much distance with your driver, but you almost forget you've right. gained with iron as well, like you said before. Is that what you've honestly found as almost the, the best gain then, that whereas you might have been hitting seven iron before, you're now hitting nine, for example. Is that where yeah. you've really found it's helped? Yeah, for example, 11 out here I was playing yesterday. It was 219 yards to the pin, and I hit an eight iron, and I landed on the front edge and just rolled it up. It was pretty calm conditions. And yeah, I mean, that that's the thing. You know, you got Tiger and, and all them back in the day hitting five iron, four irons. Right into it and i'm just sitting in this okay just a nice little eight iron it's mad um do, do you yeah it's hard to say this but do, do you recommend for amateurs they kind of look at the distance route or do you think it's just too hard for amateur golfers to really try and and gain distance and speed and keep it under control i would say be cautious with it because it can really mess up the golf swing if you're not careful and, and thoughtful about it there's a reason why there's really only been one person to make this sort of change in all of uh, in a long time, um, I don't. Th I think maybe ever, and I'm not trying to hype my, uh, myself up at one bit. It's just, it's it's not easy. And I'll tell you that the reason why it's so difficult is because, is because one, you got to learn how to get stronger without getting injured. Two, you got to learn how to swing it faster without getting injured. Mm. Three, you got to learn how to, I would say, play golf without getting injured. Right. Yeah. And and then four, you learn how to 
Well, I, I guess it's three. You get to hit. I, okay, I messed up. Hold up. One, get stronger without getting injured. Two, learn how to swing it faster. Three, learn how to hit it straighter without all without getting injured. That's a big deal. Uh, even on three, trying to hit straighter. And then four, learn how to play golf. There's four things you got to mm-hmm. do in order to do it. And sometimes each one is its own could be year long process. Um, so it's, it's not easy one bit. And I've expedited it through having intelligent people like Chris Como by my side, Greg Roscoff, MAT in Denver, getting stronger and then having a caddy and and a support group behind me. It's, it's not been just this, Oh, let's go hit it farther and let's see what Mm -hmm. happens. No, no, no. This has been very, very calculated, very difficult to do. Here is a quick question. Uh, I'm just, just going off on what we've talked about in the top topic so far in the podcast. Do you get bored of talking about distance? Like, is it is it annoying? Because I'm, I'm guessing that's what a lot of people ask you. And I, fe- I feel conscious we've asked you a few times about it today. No, no, not at all. The moment that I'll start getting uh, bored about distance in golf is the moment where I'm either one, the best in the world, and nobody can, can beat me, which is not ever going to happen. Um, in regards to distance, I'm talking about, so like beating Kyle. Um or two, I just don't have a love for the game anymore. Mm. Those, so I'll, I'll never get bored about it. Oh, that's good. Do you ever feel like with that world of spending time with Kyle and Martin and really getting into the kind of long drive, does that ever become a little bit like we almost think I'm getting too into this? I can see myself getting too bothered about long drive and actually the sport <laughs> of long drive. Or can you happily... The reason I ask that, it's a silly analogy, but like over here, rugby is a big sport. And there's been problems before. I, I did about this when I was at university where like athletes have been injured. So they've trained in the gym more to get fit. And then suddenly they almost like the look of how they start to look, which ah. actually isn't always beneficial to the sport. Aesthetic doesn't really right. matter in some sports too much. And I just wonder, did you ever find that you get almost too excited about the long drive or are you okay to kind of get involved and then step back out again? I can prioritize and sectionalize it mm. in its own in its own right very well. Yeah. I've learned how to do that. There are times where like I, I was like, whoa, okay, I'm getting too off of the act. Because it's always a balance of power and accuracy and I go between the two. I'm like, okay, I'm going too much power right now. And I go, but I got to go back to accuracy because I got a tournament coming up in a week. So I'll hone it in and and dial it all in as much as I can. And so it's just bounce back and forth between the two. Even the whole, I watched that video on your channel at at one. It was like, um, not like a garage, but that guy had that huge facility where he had a long drive competition as well. I can't remember. um, The OSPS, the... the, Was it a week uh, or a few weeks before the World Long Drive? I think it was. Yeah, yeah. And like the community feel and the fact that you all seem to get on really well. I can imagine that being like a nice place to be, a nice environment as well. It's it's one of the most comfortable places and the most inclusive places that I've ever ever, ever been a part of from from my perspective. Um, You know, a lot of people initially thought that I was going to try and, you know, make it a a show and a a freak show, whatever. No, I wanted to grow it because it has the opportunity to grow the game of golf in a really cool way. Mm. Um, And so when I went there, everybody was super amazing with me. There was no like, um, oh my gosh, he's going in there. What does he think he's doing? It, It was more of like, no, it brought me under their wing and said, we want to help you get as far, fast as you can because it's a super close, tight knit community. 20, 10, 15 years ago, it was not. It was about, it was, it was egos. Like I'm way faster than you. And now it's more of how can we all be the fastest we could possibly be like Martin and Kyle going against each other. Even Justin James and Josh Koch, we're all trying to spur each other on to hit it as far as possible because we know together we're stronger than, than apart. But they, they almost, as much as you're probably picking their brains about how to get speed, they're probably picking your brains because you can find the middle yeah. of the club face. Yeah. Like they can't exactly. always do that, you know? So I think they've exactly. probably learned a lot from you as well. Um, yep. Because we've kept you super under wraps about being a guest on the podcast, we have put on our Facebook chat some quick fire questions, if you don't mind, from our audience. Yeah. These are not vetted. Yep. They're just now going So on. you are going <laughs> to get some random ones here, okay? okay? Very quickly. Okay, uh, Collab has asked, McDonald's or KFC? McDonald's. Easy. Um, another one, again, not vetting massively. When was the last time you went for a beer with Brooks? <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> um, how long does he think he can keep up 200 miles per hour ball speed before it takes a toll on his body? Um, I, I feel like I can do it for quite a few years. There's uh, a senior division that the World Long Drive PLDA produces – excuse me, the PLDA produces and each year. It's the master's division. And ja- Jeff Gavin, I believe, is his name. I might have got it wrong. Please, I need to, I need to double check that. But they're, they're, the guy who won uh, had 215 mile an hour ball speed. Wow. 
at 55 or something like that. Oh my god! So you can do it for you can do it for a long time. That is absolutely crazy. Um, I've got another one here. Who is your favorite player to be paired with out on tour? Ooh. Uh, I, I I like personally Pat Perez. It's a lot of fun. He just seems super like cool, relaxed. He doesn't care. He just goes and has fun and and kills it. Another question: How many golf clubs do you own? Oh my gosh, own or have been given to me? <laughs> well, you own them now. <laughs> I guess. Uh, I mean, a lot of them are, are with Cobra, but probably hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of. Uh, and what? Probably, and probably what, hundreds of thousands. And what particular? What do you think you've got the most of? It has to be drivers, surely. Um. I have the most driver heads for sure. <laughs> I feel like a lot of it, like putters, are a big collector's item as well. Yeah, I'm a driver collector. Question here from David Spencer: What degree lofts are your clubs? I'm guessing you know every degree of every club. Yeah, it's a bit weird. Um, everybody talks about me like loft jacking my clubs, and the problem with that is that when you start gaining a lot of speed, you start spinning the ball a lot, and so like with an eight iron. If I spun my 8 iron at 8,000 RPMs, it wouldn't go farther than 180 to 90 yards because uh, of the height and apex mm-hmm. of it. So when I start swinging harder, the spin rate starts going up. So like now when I'm swinging it close to 108 miles an hour and, and uh, with my irons, uh, it goes upwards of like 9,000, 9,500 RPMs. So it doesn't go any farther just because there's more spin. Mm-hmm. So I have to take the loft down in order to get the proper distance gapping necessary for me. Um, so my 50, so, so it goes 58, 52, uh, 46, 41 pitching wedge is 41. That's super low. Um, and then it goes 37, nine iron, 30, I think two and a half. Eight iron, uh, seven iron is like 28, six iron is 24 or 23, uh, five irons, uh, 19, and then four iron, 16, because it's the lowest iron we can produce right now. They're trying to work on getting to 15, 14 degree loft of four iron. I suppose it makes sense though, because people know when you get the driver fit that someone who swings it really fast wouldn't typically have like a 12 degree driver. Obviously, they'd be down like no, an eight no. or a nine. So it's no different with your irons, I guess. You know what? And I've got a four and a half degree driver pretty much. Is that what's in the bag like tournament weeks? Yeah, that's what I use because oh it's, it's going to spend the 20 to 2500. Four and a half right degrees, there. that's what you're playing with right now. Yeah. Oh yes. my God. So that's like yeah. a putter. You know, you know what I'm actually quite that's surprised with those, those lofts that you were mentioning. I honestly expected like 41.23 degrees yeah. <laughs> like I, when you start i was like it was 1.5 i think in there yeah 32.5 <laughs> i think there was i would but the, the machines only go to really tenths an accuracy of a tenth so um i've got a question i think this would be a sick video for you okay this is from grant yeah. how far can you hit a putter i off saw the that one that's good yeah he's yeah, driving a putter really at four degrees sure how far do you reckon you could but hit yeah, it? I, I gotta get my uh, arm lock putter that's longer. <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't hit that. Let's say a normal thirty-five inch putter. Yeah. Okay, Perfect. I think yeah, you've got to do fun. one. Get, get an old one. Over, if I hit one good, I will probably get it over three hundred. Oh my, that has, that's got to be a Easy. YouTube short. Yeah. Get, that get it teed up, sure. hit that's it a, up, that's a great idea. low spin. Um, yep. amazing. Right, I've got one final thing. I feel like we've got on really well today. <laughs> Do you? Absolutely. Do you think we've gone Absolutely. really well? Good. Yeah. I might ruin it. Oh, oh. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, I'm used to, to I'm, I'm, You could throw anything at me. I don't think Bryson, I Bryson, I'm your mate. So if Rick ruins it now, we're cool, okay? I don't, <laughs> I don't think I could live it down by my listeners and viewers if I didn't ask you a certain question. Okay. I'm, I know what this is going to be. I'm going to drink some vodka. Before I just <laughs> look at my hand, my hand shaking. Bryson is about to press end call any second now. No, no, so, no, no. Hey, guys, to be honest with you, like, it was all, you guys have been awesome. I really don't care. Oh, thank you. You're not the only player. Okay. But you seem to get the biggest, the most stick for it. Mm-hmm. The four letter word. Four. <laughs> the which one? 
four. <laughs> Wait, I'm confused. Oh, this this could be a great clip. <laughs> you might have just summarised it. I'm saying you're not the only player to get accused of this, but sometimes maybe not always shouting for when they maybe should be shouting for oh, if a golf ball's four, going towards four, somebody. Four, four, okay, F O R E. F O R E. No, 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 you're fine. I'll, I'm, elaborate. I'm totally fine do, do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, people, people, okay, that's one of the other ones. I don't even think about it. I think I've been so, guilty of this. I've definitely called you out on this a few times, but I'd love to, I, only because of what I see on social media, little clip. So please. Have have yeah, have absolutely. you say? So, the big one was uh, I think at FedEx St. Jude Classic. I think when I hit it right, it didn't hit anybody, uh, but it went through oh past the bunkers and went into kind of into the crowd and went in the crowd, or just sort of sort of the car path. And the trouble with that is that the wind was off the right into the wind, and I hit a shot that I flared it up to the right. And I didn't think at all it would get there. And so most of the time when we hit shots, if we don't think it's going to get there, there's really no reason to say anything. And most guys don't on tour. Now you could, because of how far I'm hitting it, every single shot, say four, I could be like four, four, every single shot. And sometimes that's actually potentially more harmful because people scatter and move and they they walk into the direction of the golf ball when i see a ball and it's close but i don't think it's going to get to somewhere or whatnot that's what i'm like okay that one two they can't hear me they can't hear me because it's into the wind i could yell as loud as i possibly wanted to yell and they would not be able to hear me that's another thing now it doesn't look as good people think that I'm not being respectful at all. I don't care about patrons or people on the, on the side. That's the farthest thing from the case. I've hit people before and it's been the worst possible feeling in the world. So don't ever think that one, I don't care about fans or whatnot. Scotty Scheffler in the, at the Ryder cup hit one into someone, uh, the left of six, uh, at the Ryder cup. And like, I was sitting there helping the guy was bleeding and everything. It's just an awful situation. Um, you know, Brooks hit someone in the eye at the, the uh, uh, Paris Ryder Cup and blew someone's. Yeah, at Paris. I mean, this happens. It's a part of the sport. And don't think for one bit that we don't feel terrible for it. I hit one. I hit somebody went back in 2017 in Louisiana over on the left. Sometimes it's impossible to do anything. The one time, though, that uh, looks like I should be yelling for and it doesn't is sometimes the one where I get the most slack for it. And most of the time it's because one, I don't think it's going to get there. And two, if I'm yelling four every single time, it's not a good situation that it, to other players that are mm. on other holes. It, it, there, there's a lot of things going on in those moments as well. Um, but, but the, the biggest thing for me that, that really is uh, I think hopefully eye opening to people is that when it's into the wind, you can't yell loud enough. It's impossible. The, the, the uh, people would, they wouldn't hear you. They, they, they wouldn't hear, and it's not quick enough. And if anything, if they scatter more because of it, yeah, that's a problem too. Now, if I miss it so far right that it's never going to hit anybody, there's really mm. uh, there's nothing you can really do on that end either. Now, if it's going for someone, I see it's going for some people. I I always yell for. I mean, people clearly hear me all the time, but unfortunately, the broadcast, television, media, people that that see it. They don't necessarily understand the situation. So the one was FedEx St. Jude. I did not think it was getting there, yeah. nor did it actually get there. It landed before them and rolled into the crowd. Yeah. That was one another. Uh, another one, I can't even remember off the top of my head. It, please enlighten me because I can explain the situation if I remember the situation. Because for me, it, it's like that's so irrational that I don't even remember it yeah. for me in my, in my head. If there's a moment where it's like, oh, I messed up, I will 100% own up to it. And I'm not afraid of doing that. Um, I just I can't come off the top of my head and remember one of them. Other than that. So it's almost more isolated isolated incidences where you've explained because if we've ever talked about it, a lot of people say, "Yeah, but they, nobody can hear it when he's when it's three hundred and fifty yards away." Where I would say they could hear it, but as you you're explaining, if yeah. it's into wind, yeah, you sense. might not hear Impossible. it. Impossible. I get that, and yeah, that yep. makes sense. Downwind, hundred percent, they can hear it. So shouting it, yeah. I think it's just for me as growing up. And it's almost one of the first things we get taught as a golfer. And like, yes. it's one of the first things. Same here. And, by the way. and I just think, certainly from a few 
incidences which have probably been blown up on social media it sometimes mm-hmm. worries me about what what that portrays to the younger golfer like i would yeah. hate for a 12 year old who is just your biggest fan kind of flicks yeah. on social media and goes yeah well dad bryson doesn't shout <laughs> it do you know and i think mm-hmm. that's my, that's it's my only problem. thing I've, I've got three young children and you know i'd like to think i'm, I'm bring them up and if they play golf you'll teach them the right mannerisms which by the way you carry yourself so well on the golf course it's just those little isolated um, incidences which you know what i'm glad i've asked you and i'm glad you answered it so um well you know i didn't i didn't know what to expect from that yeah but- and, and and i would love to have another incidence because i honestly don't remember because my brain was like that's so illogical uh if anybody asked me now i could easily explain the situation i just that was the only one where i missed it right and it blew up and that was a that's a memory of mine at fedex st jude on uh, when i hit it just barely over those bunkers to the right because i'm going 50 yards left of that mm. and so when i flirt right it's into the one off the right i'm just like it's not going to get there yeah. and it flies that far for whatever reason because i had a high off the face it doesn't hit anyone it's it actually lands short and goes in people are like oh he didn't yell for again it's just like okay this thing dog legs 90 degrees left yeah and like I flared it right, it's in the, it's not going to get there, and I couldn't even yell for to make people aware of that situation. So that was one. I would love to explain another one. I don't know. Do you, do you have? I don't. One? Know, I probably have. I don't know the exact single tee times, uh, tee shots. I've got a, I've got an idea for you though. How you yeah. can kill two birds with one stone. Okay. <laughs> Next time you think it's even in doubt, shout for and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually pretty funny. They're so just like, four and subscribe. <laughs> four and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Four. Because I think then you've covered your back. That would be on the national, that would be all over the place. That yeah. would go viral. You've, you've covered your back. So if anything yeah. bad did happen That'd or if it good. hit somebody, you're teaching kids how you should be. And, and then also, that- and you're getting some subscribers. I like the idea. I love it. So St. Thank Andrews, you. I want to see four and subscribe. <laughs> Or unsubscribe to my YouTube channel, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I hit you. Um, well, Bryson, you've been a pleasure. Thank you Amazing. very much. Um, hopefully, we're not taking up too much of your time. I know you've got to go and bomb some drivers now. I feel like we've covered every question oh, we'd like to ask you. No, that was amazing. Uh, genuinely, would love to collaborate with you, make some cool videos. A hundred percent. I think the ten shot challenge would be really cool. And anytime you get over, let, let's uh, let's make it happen. Deal. Let's do it. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, um, guys. Thanks, thanks so days. much, Bryson. You're a superstar. Thanks so much, mate. All the best for the rest of the year. Thank you. Take care. Catch you soon. Thank See you, Bryson. Mate. See you.